Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> we had an amazing uh, lecture by Reverend James Lawson last evening. <laughs> and reflections by Dr. Mary Elizabeth King. It was quite an amazing event and with students who came forward to ask amazing questions. So this morning, we have a full day of events, a lot of lectures, a lot of talks, a workshop, an evening um, classical Indian music concert. So look at the program and chart your day out. Um, so the students will be coming and going. So speakers shouldn't think that, oh, my talk was not well received. <laughs> Bunch of people got up and left. No. Their classes, I told them, they can leave anytime, come anytime, because this is for them. I know this room is not well set up, so we don't have a middle aisle. So I think just be, you know, uh, uh, kind to your neighbors, let them go by. Okay. So this morning, I want to start with the Gandhi's last words, which are believed to be his last writing. It's called his talisman. And I've been reflecting on that, and I think it will give us to reflect on something as we go by today and beyond. I'll give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt, or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and weakest person whom you may have seen and ask yourself, if the step you contemplate is going to you be any use to them, will they gain anything by it? Will it store them to control over their own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj freedom for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts on yourself melt away. India had already attained freedom that time. So it was, he was not talking about political freedom. He was talking about justice, autonomy, that everyone can be able to pursue their own dreams. So it's very, very interesting. Just scribbled that was found, his last words in 1948. So I would like to welcome our guests. Again, once more, our scholars, our keynote speakers, and today is a, almost like a star-studded event. I see so many deans and great campus leaders. I'm kind of nervous here. Uh, you know, you see a few of them sometime. Now there are so many all together. So that's great. Welcome, all of you. Um, this morning, President Castro and uh, Provost Jimenez Sandoval, I'll welcome you. Um, and Provost Sandoval was our dean last year. <laughs> so then he became our provost. What a great luck for us. <laughs> and he has been part of this journey from the very inception of this idea of Gandhi's global legacy. So he's been a mentor, a friend, a guide, a teacher to me. And I'm so grateful for his guidance and mentorship. This morning's uh, moderator will be Dr. Andrew Fiala, who is the director of Ethics Center and professor of, in the Department of Philosophy. He will be uh, in introducing Dolores Horta and uh, leading the question answers and inviting Reverend Lawson for reflections. So please do welcome our provost, Jimenez Sandoval, to say a few words. Thank you, Vina, for that. I'd like to welcome you to this amazing conference. It's truly an honor to be here, and it's truly an honor to um, be asked to speak. This conference is especially important for Fresno State, as we are one of the most diverse and multicultural institutions of higher learning in California and in all of the United States as well. Yeah, big applause for that. <laughs> Our students and faculty come from all backgrounds and all corners of the world. And it is especially important that we promote here in this ground at our university, Gandhi's legacy of nonviolence. Indeed, Mahatma Gandhi's ideas of social concern and care for human dignity are more relevant today uh, more than ever. 
The celebration, therefore, is especially important because it puts into practice what Gandhi taught us. We come together, regardless of our backgrounds, to unite in justice, in peace, and in the fight for human dignity. To see each other as fellow human beings, to celebrate each other's uniqueness, and to memorialize a man who taught us that treating each other with respect and love is always spiritually rewarding and fulfilling. I would like to thank Dr. Vina Howard for all the heart and soul she invested in organizing Gandhi's Global Legacy International Conference at Fresno State. Thank you, Dr. Howard. As she mentioned before, I worked with her when I was Dean of Arts and Humanities, and I know how meaningful and valuable this conference is in promoting Gandhi's vision of justice, human dignity, and respect, all through the powerful notion of nonviolence. And it's Vina's driving force that's really behind all of this. Uh, deep gratitude to the uh, JP and Renu Sethi Foundation and the Uberoi Foundation for Religious Studies. They, generally, they generously made this event a reality. Uh, JP and Renu Sethi are present here. Are they here? They couldn't come. All right. And their transformative support creates palpable change in our valley. Both JP and Renu Sethi have made a commitment to fight violence against women and are focused on restoring their human worth and dignity. Their generous vision also touches the lives of the most dispossessed. They support homeless shelters. I have seen firsthand how their support and how they empower our gifted students through scholarships as well. Furthermore, they have committed themselves to support education about Gandhi's philosophy and legacy at Fresno State. The legacy of Gandhi is clearly visible in their intentional deeds. Let's give them a hand of applause. <clears throat> we also have two board trustees of the Uberoi Foundation here. They're not here either. They're in the hotel getting recharged for, to, for, the, for the rest of the day. Got it. So Mrs. Anu Bhatia and Jyothi Bhatia have come all the way from India to support this project. And the Uberoi Foundation is renowned for its commendable work in support of research on Indic religious traditions. The foundation has given a generous grant for this project and also has supported Dr. Vina Howard's research projects as well. So let's give them a hand of applause as well. Let's also give a really warm welcome to our dear Reverend James Lawson. <laughs> it's such an honor to have him here. He's, he's like a lightning rod, right? He, he takes that lightning and just gives it to all of us. His unique tactics of nonviolence are exemplary, and through the power of his mind and actions, those marginalized by violence and injustice have seen a clear ray of hope and light. We are all thankful for the road he constructed for us all. Thank you, Reverend Lawson. Also honoring us with her presence is Torres Huerta. It, she is the living embodiment of Gandhi's principles of dedication to service. She continues to fight for the rights of the disenfranchised and fight for just social justice. We are so fortunate to have her here, a living legend. And finally, I'd like to welcome all the scholars who have traveled great distances from uh, different states and countries. You're here from Virginia, Georgia, Detroit, North Carolina, Kansas, Oregon, Florida, Oxford, Kerala, India, and different parts of California. It's truly impressive. It's a truly impressive list. Uh, we hope you enjoy our university and this beautiful weather we have. It's, it's perfect fall weather. <laughs> and are glad to have you celebrate Gandhi's legacy with us here as well. And now it's my true honor to welcome President Joseph Castro, whose vision of excellence, compassion, and celebration of our diverse backgrounds has made Fresno State a model university. Please welcome Dr. Castro. Thank you, Provost Jimenez Sandoval. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome all of you here today and join our provost in welcoming you. Reverend Lawson, welcome back. I, I still remember our lunch together not long ago. And, uh, and welcome back to Dolores. It's always a, an honor to have you on campus. And uh, 
and you're both always welcome, and, and all of you. I'm, I'm really happy that you're all here for this uh, very important international conference that our Professor Howard uh, initiated. And thank you so much, Fina, for your leadership. Well, I hope that you've had a little bit of a chance to see our campus. And uh, just outside the doors here is uh, the only Armenian genocide monument at a university, I believe, in the whole United States. And if you have a chance to, uh, to visit, I, I hope that you will. Uh, it was probably one of the most powerful moments of my presidency when we opened that uh, particular monument. We, uh, we had broken ground on it uh, one Sunday afternoon, and we put 100 chairs out. We thought maybe 100 people would come for that uh, groundbreaking, and 1,000 people came. So when we did the official opening, we finished the memorial, the monument, just hours before we did the official opening. We had a thousand chairs out and 5,000 people came. <laughs> and the whole Maple Mall was full. And uh, it was an incredible moment uh, for our entire campus and, and community. So I hope that you have a chance to visit uh, our Armenian Genocide Monument. I also hope you have a chance to visit our Peace Garden next to the library, where you will see uh, Gandhi's statue in honor of his legacy of nonviolent civil disobedience, which has inspired uh, civil rights movements around the world. And from my own office balcony, I can see the Peace Garden each day, and it's an inspiration for me because not only is Gandhi there, but there are statues of Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, and Jane Addams. And in fact, the baby that uh, Martin Luther King is holding in his monument would have basically been me. That would have been my age at the time. And I'm a child of the great society and grandson of farm workers uh, here in the Central Valley. And in fact, our provost as well has those roots. It's the first time in Fresno State's 108 year history where we've had uh, two um, Central Valley and Latino uh, leaders for this university. And I should say we did a, a national search for the provost position with uh, so many distinguished uh, scholars who applied and who were considered. But in the end, we had our our provost right here at home and our Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. And I couldn't be happier to work with him. We've been making a lot of progress already in just his first few weeks on the job. In terms of the uh, Peace Garden itself, I also wanna share with you that we have plans to add a Nelson Mandela statue. And uh, for those of you who would like to get involved in that effort, uh, we would sure welcome uh, your your involvement and your support, but that's a high priority for our campus. And Dr. Kapoor, I see is over here, my friend, who inspired the entire Peace Garden, and he is working with me and so many others uh, to have Nelson Mandela added. Good morning, Dr. Kapoor. Thank you so much for your leadership. Well, even uh, thousands of miles away from India, where Gandhi lived, our region, our valley has continued the legacy of Gandhi's teachings of nonviolence with our visionary leaders from Cesar Chavez to Dolores Huerta and many others. And Cesar Chavez remarked, and I quote, I am convinced that the truest act of courage, the strongest act of humanity is to sacrifice ourselves for others in a totally nonviolent struggle for justice, unquote. And I think Fresno State is an ideal place for this conference uh, because what we're talking about here is fully consistent with the values that we have here at Fresno State. Our mission is to boldly educate and empower students for success, and our three values are diversity, 
distinction, and discovery. And underpinning that are values of diversity, respect, and equality. There is a President's Commission on Human Relations and Equity that works very hard with me and with our cabinet and the entire campus. Dr. Howard's a member of that, and I see other members of that commission here today, but it's dedicated to the mission of supporting acceptance and fairness at all levels of the university. And whether it is in our hiring or in our programs, uh, it's consistent across our university. And I'm actually very proud of the fact that our president's cabinet uh, reflects the diversity of our Central Valley. Fresno State is an institution we're exploring the diversity of thought and discouraging marginalization is valued as a means of enriching knowledge and critical thinking. And diversity is one of Fresno State's top values, a pride point for celebrating the differences and commonalities of our students and the region, which together build opportunity and success. And just last month, our commitment to diversity and inclusion earned our university its sixth consecutive Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award from Insight into Diversity Magazine. And I want to thank all of my colleagues for their hard work on that. And there are not many universities across the country that have earned that distinction and I'm particularly proud of our campus for doing it six consecutive years, and we continue to expand our programs and our support for diversity all across the campus. I believe that through our collective and intentional efforts, diversity creates a welcoming environment where everyone feels connected to our mission and everyone thrives. And as president here, that's the ultimate goal for me, is that everyone will thrive. Our students, our faculty, our staff, our administration, our 230,000 alumni, and our many, many friends. So I count those of you who are visiting here uh, from other places as our friends, and, uh, and I welcome you to campus, and I hope that you'll continue to visit us often and uh, I hope that you have a very enjoyable conference. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dolores Huerta, and I got a note about a housekeeping issue before we do so, which is that uh, due to wildfires, there are some closures in Southern California freeways, so if any of you are heading back, check uh, Caltrans before you go, apparently 405 and five, we, uh, <laughs> or stay with us an extra day. So uh, our hearts go out to those people in Southern California and the wildfires. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some introduction, then Dolores, it's, it's time for you, okay? So Dolores Huerta is founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. She co-founded the United Farm Workers of America with Cesar Chavez. She's a labor leader and community organizer. She has worked for civil rights and social justice for over 50 years. In 1962, she and Cesar Chavez founded the United Farm Workers, and she has served as vice president and played a critical role in many of the union's accomplishments for four decades. In 2002, she received the Puffin Nation $100,000 prize for creative citizenship, which she used to establish the Dolores Huerta Foundation. She's received numerous awards, among them, the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award from President Clinton in 1998, and in, and in 2012, President Obama bestowed Dolores Huerta with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. Thank you for joining us. Gracias, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I am so happy to be here. And I just want to say, I want to thank uh, Dr. Castro uh, for having the celebration of Gandhi's uh, 150th birthday. And I want to thank Dr. Kapoor, because uh, Dr. Kapoor, as many of you know, was just all over California saying to people, we have to celebrate Gandhi's 150th birthday. And so, Dr. Kapoor, I'm, I'm glad you all make it, made, made it happen. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, as you all know, uh, nonviolence uh, uh, was a central part of the United Farm Workers. Uh, before we started the union, uh, Cecil and I uh, sat down and we made plans about who, how we were going to start the union. You know, people think that Caesar walked into a field and all of a sudden everybody was organized. Well, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it actually took a lot of planning and even before we uh, had our first meeting, first house meeting with farm workers, uh, Cecil and I sat down how we wanted this organization to look like. And uh, it was based on Gandhi. It had to be based on Gandhi's principles, uh, the principles of nonviolence, uh, the principles of sharing, the principles of volunteerism, you know, that everybody would work. And Caesar's dream was to have ashrams everywhere. And uh, of course, La Paz, uh, which is the, uh, now the headquarters of the United Farm Workers, uh, that was the dream there. And, and it actually happened. And when we think about how the United Farm Workers, this incredible organization where we had hundreds of people working for the organization for no money, that they were all volunteers. And everything that everybody earned, every, all the money that people gathered went to the organization uh, to be able to uh, spread the organization, to build, uh, make the organization stronger and build, you know, get more people out there to join. It was all on the principles of Gandhi. It's not like that anymore, I have to say. Uh, you know, when, when Caesar passed away, uh, that part of his dream uh, went with him. Uh, but the fact that it even existed, I think, and hopefully someday could be recreated. But I also think that having uh, the celebration here in Fresno is also very symbolic. And here in, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, because when we look at this area, number one, I guess it just came out in the news this week that Fresno is, you have regained the title of the number one uh, a county for agriculture, right? Number one in the whole, in the whole United States of America, Fresno is number one. But at the same time, we have other number ones, which are not very good. And some of them, of course, are not Fresno, but the whole uh, San Joaquin Valley. And one of them is poverty, number one in poverty. Uh, of course, I'm from Kern County, which is Bakersfield, and we're number one in oil, okay? Uh, uh, so we're number one, in, uh, and, and the other thing is that uh, we are also uh, number one in pollution in the San Joaquin Valley and in incarcerations, the San Joaquin Valley. From starting from Arvin, California to Sacramento, we have 22 prisons that have been built since 1965, 22 prisons and one university, the University of Merced. University of Merced. So I think when we put this all together, we can see that we are living in a culture of violence, the culture of violence. And that is what I think uh, really makes it more important that we really make the culture of nonviolence, of ahimsa, you know, Gandhi's lessons have to be, we have to kind of make sure that we are able to spread these messages because this is not a living solution for everybody, you know. This is something that we have to really counter. And the only way that we can do that, we know, is by organizing. And I'm going to just start with the, the whole issue of the food. You know, I was, uh, I don't buy the Wall Street Journal, but sometimes they give it away free, so I take it. <laughs> and there was an article in there uh, about, you know, Bayer who bought Monsanto. You know, Monsanto, which is the uh, a corporation that uh, created this uh, uh, this uh, Roundup and uh, this is one of the pesticides that they have used on golf courses and, of course, in our agricultural fields. And we know that it is very, that it's got a, a poison in it that really not only hurts the plants, but also hurts people. But it was interesting because uh, the people of Monsanto, who's owned by Bayer, say, well, we know that there's a lot of lawsuits about people that have been poisoned, that have cancer, that have Hodgkin's disease, but we're making so much money on this that we've got to continue to produce it. We're making so much money that we've got to continue to produce this. I mean, what does it say about our culture of violence in our United States of America? That you know you're producing something that is hurting people, 
and killing people. But okay, as long as you're making money on it, it's okay. The whole thing with the incarcerations, as long as they're making money by private prisons and, you know, we're making money on incarcerating people, it's okay, let's keep on doing it. And I think this whole idea that we have a profit-driven a profit -driven society, that it's okay to hurt people as long as we can make money off of it. Somehow this has got to change. We've got to start challenging that. And if this is what, now I guess I'll use the word capitalism, is it, if this is what it is, then there's something wrong with the system. And I remember somebody said the other day, you know, they say, oh, the system is broken. No, it's not broken, it's working. The system is actually working. So that means that there's something wrong with the system that we have to change. And we know the only way that we can do that is from the bottom up, from starting with people. And, and when they talk about the S word, socialism, <laughs> that everybody is afraid of that word social. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean, and it should mean, that the resources of the world belong to everybody, not just for the greedy few? That we, could, we need to share the resources of the world so that we do not have these economic inequities where you have the 1% that has 50% of the wealth and the 10% of corporations and wealthy families that have 90% of the wealth in our country. This is totally, totally wrong, and it's got to be addressed, and we shouldn't be afraid to address it. It was interesting. Uh, we've all heard in the news that uh, the power is being shut down in many parts of California uh, because of PG&E. You know, they got to make sure there's no more fires. And then I started thinking about that. PG&E. How is it that a public utility can be owned by investors? Hey, there's something wrong with that picture. There is something wrong with that picture that you can have a public utility that is owned by investors. Public utilities need to be owned by the people. Need to be owned by the people. And we hear these arguments about government control. The one thing is, when we have something that is owned by government, there is accountability. If you have something that is owned by a corporation, how could you make them accountable? Maybe through a boycott of something or the other, but there's no only you can make them lose money because I like to say their hearts are in their wallets, right? You know, so you know we have to think about that. How can we make corporations accountable, or make or some of these things that corporations do actually make them come by the you know make them be uh, controlled by the people and run by the people? And I think this is one of Gandhi's sayings also, and I may not say this exactly correctly, but Gandhi said. You know, you will always have enough resources to fill the need. We will never have enough resources to fill the greed. We will never have the resources to fill the greed. So we've got to think of ways that we could kind of incorporate Gandhi's sayings, you know, put them as part of our educational system so that every single person that is really educated can really understand what that means about caring for other people, again, about sharing the resources uh, uh, of our country. The other saying, of course, and, and we think of all of the people that come out of these great universities like Yale and Harvard, and you would think, well, these are people that are quote unquote educated and, and that they would really care about people, care about the earth. And that was the other thing that Gandhi said, knowledge without wisdom knowledge without wisdom. And it kind of makes you think sometimes that so many of these educated people, supposedly, that come out of these universities, that they are the ones that are also involved in creating wars, you know, and in, in creating more greed in our society and not really using their you know, the high-priced so-called education uh, to really think about, uh, about helping other people. So, uh, you know, these are the things I think that we have to challenge. And, um, and I have been speaking a lot about racism because we know that racism in our society has really led to a lot of violence. More recently, when we see that people are killed because they're Mexicans, uh, that people are killed because they're Jews, uh, because they're Muslims, or because they're, they're Af African Americans. So we have to start addressing this. And I really think an, there's an easy way to do this, and that is in our educational system that we have in the United States of America, and starting with uh, pre-K, pre-kindergarten, and educating all of our children that we are one human race. One human race. And children get this. 
You know, when I speak about this to kindergartens and third graders, it's really interesting. And what I say to them, you know, we are all one human race. And our human race started in Africa. Africa. So what does that mean? You know, we have a lot of different ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. We have a lot of different cultures, a lot of different nationalities. But we all came from Africa. And that means that we are all Africans of different shades and colors. And when I say that to children, I say to them that we are all related. And you know what the children do? And I've, I've seen this happen at three different schools. The kids actually get up and start running towards each other and embracing each other. I mean, children get it. So, but we have to say to that, you know, say that, you know, kind of get that into, just remind people that we are one human race. And I like, like to say that that means we're all related to, to Obama, okay? <laughs> that means we're all related to the Kennedys, okay? You know? And I, have, I actually asked them to, um, to hold hands. I say, you know, with the person that's sitting next to you, just hold their hand. Just hold their hand. And as our Native American brothers and sisters like to say, say to, to the person next to you, say, hello, relative. <laughs> So I think that that's a really good way to, to get that across, you know? It's really way, a good way to get that across. I do. <laughs> then I think we also have to remind people again when we talk about our country. You know, when they talk about our country, uh, there's a difference between our country and our government. You know, when we talk about uh, the, the founders, they were the, not the founders of the country, the, the, the founders of our government, because when they came here, the founders of the government, the country was already here, and the country was already brown. <laughs> and I'd love to say to people, you know, Google a map of the United States before 1847. Google it, and you will get a shock when you see that a third of the United States was part of Mexico. And so when they tell us to go back where we came from, we just say, uh-uh, we are where we came from, okay? <laughs> we, we are, we're from right here. So, you know, we, we like to say, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Okay, we, we were here before the border. So we know that we have a lot of work to do. And I think that what I'm talking about during our educational, putting this into our educational system, this can actually happen. How do we do that? We have to take over our school boards to begin with. You know, we have to you know, make sure that the ethnic studies uh, that is trying to be passed right now in the state legislature, that they actually pass that so that really people can learn. I think one of the good things about the San Joaquin Valley, and we can see it here in this room here, is our diversity. As our diversity. Uh, we are so fortunate that, that in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, because of so many immigrants that came here to work mostly in the farms, that uh, we were lucky enough to grow up with a lot of diversity, a lot, a, lot, a lot of different cultures, unlike our president who never had that privilege. He never had that privilege, unfortunately. And he never knew how to work. That was another sad thing about our president. <laughs> he never knew how to work because he was born well, wealthy. So I think in, in the, those circumstances, we are very, very lucky. Oh, one other good thing about the San Joaquin Valley, I actually grew up in Stockton, California, and we had the first Hindu temple there in Stockton, California, in the United States of America, in the United States of America. Okay, so how do we go for, you know, get there uh, where we need to get there? Uh, of course, trying to bring this, uh, all of these lessons that we learn, a nonviolence from Gandhi, you know, uh, from Reverend Lawson, from Dr. Martin Luther King, from Cesar Chavez, bring them into our school systems. And then when we talk about our, our government, what do we do there? And here I'm going to quote Coretta Scott King. Coretta Scott King said, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going, to amend, I'm going to amend her statement, and I'm going to say, we will never have peace in the world until feminists take power, okay? 
So what is a feminist or who is a feminist? Somebody who cares about immigrant rights, who cares about worker rights, who cares about LGBT human rights, you know, uh, who cares about our, 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 our planet, you know, to make sure on this global warming. It's somebody, and of course, women's reproductive rights. That is what a feminist is. And so the men in the room here are also feminists, okay? So let's give them all an applause also to make this happen. But we know uh, that in order to get there, that we really have to get rid of the apathy that we have in our society. And Helen Keller said that the greatest disease that exists in human beings that scientists have not been able to cure is apathy. Because we know that if every person would get engaged and get involved, that then we wouldn't have the situation that we're in now. That people don't realize that they have uh, an obligation, and as Robert Kennedy said, before he was, just before he was killed, he said, we have an obligation, we have obligations and responsibilities to our fellow citizens. And so I, I think we all have to really take that seriously and really try to organize other people that we know that are not involved. And so many people, because of the oppression that we have in our society, they feel that they really can't contribute, that somehow this is not for them. There's other people that do that work. And they're busy with their lives, their work lives, their family lives, their school lives, and they don't feel that they have a necessity to get involved. Well, this is what we have to do as organizers. And this is what Gandhi did. Everything that Gandhi did, and you know, Caesar, he read everything he could about Gandhi. Everything, his whole library was just about Gandhi. He said, and I said, Caesar, why are you reading so much about Gandhi? He says, I just want to know how he organized the people, okay? How did he get them to be able to do the marches? And of course, Caesar also did the same thing with the farm workers. You know, making poor people understand that they had the power to make changes, to make changes for, for themselves. And this is what we try to do with my, with my foundation, organize people in their communities so that they can take the power. And we always quote Reverend Lawson, because Robert, Reverend Lawson says, how do we dismantle the systems of oppression? How do we dismantle the systems of oppression? And this is what we're trying to do, Reverend Lawson, following your words, trying to dismantle those systems of oppression. You know, uh, I'm going to quote our local sheriff in Kern County, and it's come out in, in the Los Angeles Times. I don't know about the Fresno Bee over here, but he said that the way to end the homeless problem, that he's really easy. He's going to arrest them all. He's going to put them all in jail. This is his solution. These are the things that we are up against, the things that we're fighting. So, you know, we've got to take over our own local communities, you know, take over our school boards, take over our city councils, take over our boards of supervisors uh, to make sure that the Savile King Valley, that we do not have to be number one in all the negatives, but we can be number one in all of the promises, you know, uh, to make sure that the wealth, the incredible wealth of this valley is shared by the people that create the wealth. And I'm gonna say just a simple word about the refugees on the border. And this is another thing. Um, when we think of our foreign policies, and I like to use the word bananas. How many bananas do we eat every day in our United States of America? Do the people of Guatemala get the bananas? No, dole banana, chiquita banana. American banana corporations get the money that we spend on bananas so the people in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, those places where the bananas come from, they never get the money. We've got to change that. But the only way we can change it is we've got to start from the bottom up to make sure that we can make it happen. And I think uh, when we think of Gandhi, we think of the sacrifices that he made, that the people in India made, when we think of the farmer movement, you know, we had five people that were killed in the farmer movement. So the farmer could get bathrooms in the field. You know, get the right to organize, get cold drinking water, get rest periods. You know, the people had to be killed to make that happen. Well, I think that when we think of those sacrifices that so many people made, then we can think of the commitments that we have to make. And I just want to say to everybody, everybody that let's all become organizers. Let's spread the lessons of Gandhi and of Cesar. And many of you know that I recently got arrested here with the home care workers. <laughs> <coughs> And, uh, uh, people, me, and people say, well, why did you get arrested? Well, I hadn't planned to get arrested. <laughs> but when I saw the violence uh, against one of the, the head of the union, Arnulfo de la Cruz, 
a young man that I knew since he was a little kid. He was a terror when he was a kid, but he ended up being a Fulbright scholar who knew <laughs> and the head of a union. But that this deputy sheriff came up behind him and started choking him. And I'm glad that I wasn't close by there because I know I would have grabbed his arm or something. Then I would have been arrested for something else for assaulting an officer or something. But when I saw that, it just made me so angry. So I said, I've got to protest. You know, I've got to get up there and get arrested too with the rest of the workers. And it, one of, uh, some of you may have known Reverend Bill O'Donnell from Oakland, California. Uh, he was a Catholic priest there. He went to jail about 200 times. And he said, everybody should go to jail at least once in their life. Because when we go to jail, what we see, who's in jail? It's all the poor people, people that have no defense, people that shouldn't even be there, many of them. And, you know, so this is something, again, uh, that I think when we think of Gandhi and the sacrifices that he made and other uh, leaders made. So let's I'll just all make our commitment uh, that we're going to spread the word of nonviolence, uh, that we're going to live that, uh, we're going to erase the culture of violence that we have in our society, and, and I think that we can do it. And so I'm going to ask you a really simple question, and, and I know you know the answer. And uh, I'm, the question I'm going to ask you is, <clears throat> who's got the power, okay? Because when we were organizing and people would say to Caesar and myself, how are you going to get the farm workers uh, to be able to organize? They're so poor, no money, not citizens. They don't speak the English language. How can you possibly organize them? And we said, it's simple. You just tell people the power is in your person. And this is all the power that we need. The power is in our person. But we know we can't do it alone, that we've got to come together to make it happen. And of course, the workers did. And we can do the same thing, okay? So I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to ask you who's got the power. And I want you to say, we've got the power. And when I say what kind of power, <clears throat> I want you to <laughs> <clears throat> I want to say people power. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, but I like to say to people, let's shout it so loud. Shout it so loud that the neo-Nazis can hear us. Okay? <laughs> the misogynists, you know, the, the ones that don't want to dominate women. Okay? Uh, uh, this, uh, the, all of those, uh, uh, the homophobes up there, the people who are anti-gay, uh, all of those climate deniers, okay, so that they can hear us. So, Okay, the question is, who's got the power? You're going to say, we've got the power. What kind of power? People power. Let's go. Who's got the power? We've got the power. Okay, some people aren't sure. <laughs> I think we can do better than that. Let's, let's go one more time. <clears throat> who's got the power? We've got the power. What kind of power? People power. Okay, are we going to go out there, organize, spread the culture of nonviolence, what do we say? Se puede or no se puede? Sí, se puede. That means yes, we can, in case you didn't know. Okay, let's do it, let's do it all together with an organized hand clap. All together, let's go. Sí, sí, se puede. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Lawson, we yeah we we'd like to invite you to come up front, Reverend Lawson, if you'd like to make a couple of comments and remarks. Um, Dolores, would you like to sit at the table with Reverend Lawson, and we can have a a, a conversation between the two of you? Um, and I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but I think we should let this one happen a little bit. I hope my our future speakers are okay with that. Um, Thank you very much. So, uh, Reverend Lawson, we'd love to hear your thoughts and remarks, and then we'll give you guys about 15 minutes, speakers. Are you, is everyone okay with that, the rest of the folks on the panel the rest of the day here? Uh, we don't want to cut into other people's time, but we have two icons with us. So, uh, we're happy to hear your conversation.
I think that one of the most hurtful statements that have been made uh, too often over the last, uh, over the, uh, oh, okay. Do what? Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, I think that um, over the last uh, couple of months, especially, or three months more, one of the worst uh, uh, pieces of analyst about our situation has been made by. Okay. Am I better yet? Is that better? Okay. okay. I'll hang in close. Um, over the last several months, one of the most destructive things said in public conversation is the only Democratic candidate running for president who can beat Donald Trump is Joe Biden. Now, I have nothing against Joe Biden, but for a political party in a nation of 330 million people to say that the worst president the nation has ever had can only be defeated by one man, one person, is the kind of analysis that is self-destructive of our democracy. And so I, w I want to put on the table this morning very quickly that one of the millions of competent human beings in our nation that we have is Dilores Huerta, who would make <laughs> a better president than the one we have. <laughs> because of, among other things, she has always been a person that has sought to, through observation and through heart and mind and spirit, understand people and care about people, and care about equality and justice, care about using the powers that we have in order to build a society that one group of people in the United States back at the 19, 19, and, uh, in 1899 or so called the beloved community, where every child, every human being has access. And is allowed to expose their living uh, to uh, an environment, an ecosystem, spiritual, moral, intellectual, that allows them to seize hold of the life that they have and to use it well across their own years. So I, I want to, to lift that up as the first thing I want to say. And then the um, second reflection I would like to uh, lift up is her emphasis upon power and the emphasis upon the fact that uh, every human being has power and that every human being learning to use that power in a fashion that ennobles their own living, lifts their own understanding of life and therefore is transmitted to other people around them, their intimate and their extended family is a part of the beginning of nonviolent struggle in my mind and part of the first laboratory for practicing nonviolent struggle. It, it does not end there because what Gandhi launched um, uh, in South Africa in 1906, especially and onward until he left, um, was to give uh, an alternative way of organizing uh, to dismantle injustice. Uh, in the case of Gandhi, dismantle a little bit of the colonialism of his day, a little bit of the imperial theology, the imperial world of his day in South Africa, something of the racism, something of the sexism and the like. Uh, but what Gandhi launched even more than that is the fact that in the 20th century, uh, in every decade of the 20th century, there were struggles around the world that essentially used nonviolent 
tactics and methodologies and philosophies. Uh, so that I maintain that one of the most important books that was written in the 20th century for our purposes is the book of Force More Powerful by Jack Peter Ackerman and Jack Duvall. Now, in uh, the 60s, uh, we had no how-to books. You have to understand that. There was that not that much on nonviolent methodology all written that I know of. We had many discussions in pacifist movements, uh, pacifist circles rather, in university as well as in the community. We had many uh, conversations about the Gandhian methodologies that had been used in various places in India and South Africa in particular. Um, the Book of Force More Powerful describes not only the Indian campaign, but also describes the Nashville campaign, the campaign in the United States, also describes the Polish solidarity movement in, in, in a single chapter, also describes the Velvet Revolution in a single chapter, also, also describes uh, what happened in South Africa at the end of the century that uh, saw the release of Mel Nelson Mandela from prison and, and therefore, after 27 years of prison, allowed him to come out of prison as the leader of the movement for a new constitution and to begin the process of trying to understand how we create a new South Africa. A astonishing switch of roles, but an astonishing exchange of power. And that was largely done by a, a nonviolent movement. In that case, it was the boycott by ordinary Africans in Port Elizabeth in the east side of South Africa, where they boycotted white business in their own city because they wanted to inform white business people who were in most cases settlers in South Africa that you have a stake in the future and in our society. So they boycotted white business in order to demand that white business leadership get involved in the negotiations with the society that would help to effect change. If you have not seen that book or used that book in classes, it is a fundamental book that ought to be used because it succinctly and in a very well, excellently researched way uh, uh, shows in both the critique of nonviolent struggles, but then also the wonder of nonviolent struggle and beginning the transformation of a large part of our globe in the, in the, in the 20th century. And so I'm going to conclude by saying that not only is, uh, as Dolores Wirt have brought us a, a practical, experiential conversation on nonviolent philosophy embedded in the work that we have done for many years in our country, uh, uh, I, w I want to say that uh, if you study these movements in the United States, you would see a far greater variety of tactics um, that are used. A nonviolent struggle must be a lifelong struggle and must be an informed struggle. And so the, the second book I want to commend is um, the, the Three Little Volumes by Jean Sharp, who, who died just about a year ago. Uh, Jean and I were in college together in Ohio back in the 40s. He was at Ohio State. I was in at Baldwin Wallace College up near Cleveland, uh, Ohio State down in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, but we met as students, and we were keenly interested in, at that time, in pacifism, but especially we were, we talked often about Gandhi and the Indian movement of, of the exchange of power from the British Empire to the people of India. The biggest task that we have today is not among nations or between nations. The USA continues to make uh, different nations and peoples our enemies for today or our enemies for tomorrow. That will end in vast disaster 
if we are not allowed to change it. We must have in the United States a prolonged nonviolent struggle in which in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communities, the systematic effort to exercise compassion and truth and love as the powers that not only transform inwardly, but as the power that can shake the foundations of oppression and fear. The Gene Sharp book I want to mention is The Politics of Nonviolent Action. It's available still in paperback. And Gene Sharp did ex some 25 or 40 years of study and that book reflects his discovery of nonviolent tactics across 4,000 years of written human history. Not something that had just emerged in the 20th century, but where in, maybe intuitively, but maybe also spiritually, our four parents, great numbers of them, decided that they did not have to hate to make a change in their community or in their own status. They did not have to despise people, but that the love that they learned as babies from their parents and grandparents, that the compassion they discovered in accepting themselves and loving themselves did represent the power that could transform the society in which we live. Gene Sharp lists 194 tactics, methods used by the human race uh, across the centuries. Uh, he and I had a conversation a few years ago in which we were talking about this, and uh, we both agreed that probably there were at least 210 uh, tactics and methodologies that have been used. His book doesn't, for example, include the story of the 154th Regiment of Massachusetts that was organized for black soldiers with white officers that fought in the Civil War. The black men, both slaves and ex-slaves, who joined that regiment, which was one of the first, um, were promised so much money per month by uh, the Washington government uh, for being in the army and for helping to fight the war. The first month of their paychecks, the amount of money that had been, been promised was reduced. And as the first men received their pay envelopes, they saw that it was reduced. And a cry began to move across the whole group in the, in the lines for pay. And some said, well, they have, they have not fulfilled their promise of what we want or what they said they would give. So a conversation swept across the whole regiment. They decided not to accept the pay envelopes that month until the army <coughs> fulfilled its promise in the future. That's one that could be added to Gene Sharp's book. I don't know what you would call it. But the point I'm making is that if we're convinced of the efficacy and the power of what Gandhi um, um, introduced and collated uh, under the rubrics, nonviolence, soul force, uh, satyagraha, if we're convinced that that power is, out of the 20th century, what we human beings need most, then add to that this book by uh, Jane Sharp that analyzes both the dynamic of nonviolence uh, and also then lists the many methods that people have used. The first civil disobedience act, as far as I know, was is to be found in the first chapter of the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Bible. Pharaoh tells midwives, um, you must see to it that every male baby is birthed still, stillborn. And two midwives who are named there in that first chapter of that book 
refused. No, they did not, a nuance of it, they did not go back to Pharaoh and say, we will not do it. Resistance does not require always boldness. And in some situations you cannot and you dare not be bold. You will be smashed instantly. So if you're interested in resistance that builds resistance, many times you have to find a securitist way of doing the resistance. So uh, uh, the Gene Sharp book, 194 plus instances where ordinary people like ourselves, maybe some extraordinarily intelligent very often without the information that we have today of ourselves and our histories, um, exercised a human spirit that knew it was powerful and that it was in sync with the universe and in sync with life itself. You don't need to call that God. I call that God. You don't need to call it God. But we need to also understand, nevertheless, it is a gift of life itself. And it is a gift so powerful that when we begin to tap it and use it personally, daily, and use it in all of our kinships and relationships, and use it in organizing our unions, our congregations, our social fraternities, our business organizations, where we use it in all of these ordinary places where we live and work and play, uh, we will be astounded by the power that it unleashes uh, because Gandhi recognized, as did Martin Luther King Jr., and a host of unknown people recognized that there is a power to be tapped in life itself. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I took more call than necessary. No, that, that was... Uh, you made me nervous, but everybody else... No, thank you for sharing your incredible knowledge with us and inspiration, Reverend Watson. Uh, I just want to add one, one thing, maybe two things, okay? One of them is that, and I want to quote uh, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on this one, uh, as we talk to people and we try to... Uh, try to change their minds about these issues. We talk about racism, sexism, misogyny, uh, homophobia, etc. Uh, and I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that remember that racism is, is sickness. So these folks are sick. They may be ignorant and they may also just be sick. And so we have to think ourselves as healers and so when we talk to them, and, it, and these are difficult conversations that often we want to avoid. But even Gandhi said that sometimes you have to have conflict, you know, to be able to change things. So we should not be hesitant to bring up the difficult conversations, okay? Remembering that we're trying to heal people. And then at the same time, when we are the victims of uh, the misogyny or the racism, that, uh, again, I try not to... Uh, Answer with anger, which is the first reaction that we get, when, especially women, people of color, uh, not to respond with anger, but remember that we're trying to heal the other person. And remember, again, this is when we really invoke the nonviolence in ourselves and our persons as we try to heal other people. And then again, when we think at the, at the, at the national level, and we think of again, why we have to elect good leaders which is what Reverend Lawson started out with, is we have to think of the amount of money of our tax dollars that go to the Defense Department compared to what goes to uh, Health and Human Services and what, it goes, what, what we uh, actually uh, give to education. You know? So we have to change that balance. You know? and we have to make a balance that is not there right now. So that's got to be part of, our, uh, of the work that we have to do when we talk about uh, doing the work of nonviolence. Thank you.